This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. Learn to think. Now I'm going to tell you three stories about fungi that get a bit gnarly. But before I do, let's try and see things from the perspective of the fungus. Here is a fungus baby or spore, and one of the first things it needs to do is find food. So it often creates a spore boner. Jerry, it's not called a spore boner. What is it? A germ tube? Really? All right, well, you can see the contents of the spore sort of oozing out into that germ tube, which tries to find food. Now, like the Dorito, some food that fungi like to eat comes in packaging that's hard to open. So these germ tubes have evolved ways to break through barriers. Look at this one, busts right through the cell wall of a plant, using chemicals and force. And once it's in, starts making a series of tubes that start munching. This right here is nematoctonus, a bit of an unusual spore because it can swim with the aid of its spore boner. Jerry, it's a flagellum. Anyway, this fungus hunts these tiny worms called nematodes, which are everywhere. Here you can see a whole bunch of spores clustered around the nematode's anus, as is the custom. After attaching, you can see they make germ tubes that enter the body, and then the fungus can eat the nematode from the inside out. Remember, try and see things from the fungi's perspective. Once it's done eating, it's time to make some babies. Here you can see the spores being formed and then pushed out through those tubes. These spores can swim, and nematodes are plentiful, so the fungus doesn't have to get too fancy about how and where they're released. But most spores aren't particularly gifted in moving, so it's quite important that they wind up close to whatever it is they eat. Fungi have evolved a number of clever ways to get the spores to the right place, but perhaps the cleverest way is getting the food itself to help out. The genus Entomophthora, for example, likes to eat flies. These flies here are infected, but unlike that nematode, they're not dead. Yet, Entomophthora starts off as these specialized little spores called conidia, which are quite sticky, especially when they come in contact with the outside covering of a fly. Like before, they use a germ tube to create a hole in the outside of the insect. The contents of the spore then go into the insect's blood or hemolymph. At first, the fungus just nibbles a little bit avoiding vital organs and targeting fat cells. Their backside starts to fill up with the fungus, which takes on a creamy white appearance. <laughs> Nasty. But other than that, they seem fine doing all the fly things that a fly do. But the fungus is up to something else. After about 48 hours or so, endomophthora cells start entering the fly's brain. As the number of cells in the brain increase, they seem to target a group of neurons involved in the fly's sleep-wake cycle, or circadian cycle. The science hippies know this because the fly's brain is small enough that they've been able to map it out in quite some detail. On the day the fly will die, just around sunset, and yes, fungi can tell time, it's crazy, those cells in the brain seem to trigger the fly to release juvenile hormone. This in turn creates a burst of energy in the fly. Oddly, around the same time the fly stops flying. From here on in, don't call it a fly, call it a walk. <laughs> Kill me. I mean, look at this poor bastard. Not only is he about to die, he's getting chased around by a giant paintbrush. All this hormone energy and the not flying seems to generally cause the fly to go up or summit. When it is suitably heighted, the fly then extends its mouth parts or proboscis. By now the fly isn't in very good shape, so it's all a bit shaky. Now they don't know who makes it, either the fly or the fungus, but this adhesive starts leaking out the proboscis, which glues the fly's mouth parts to the surface. And now the fly is stuck. With the fly firmly in place, the fungus can now eat all the things that it's been patiently avoiding. Organs, the testes, I mean you save those for last. And in one final manipulation, the fungus causes the fly to raise its wings to get them out of the way for what happens next. With its food source depleted, the fungus is now ready to make some babies. Here you can see it engulf what remains of the fly. And if you look close near the top, you can see the spores hitting the glass of the camera lens. The fungus creates these specialized structures called conidiophores. You can see them emerge here in silhouette. They're little stalks with spores on the end of them, which then get shot off by a liquid cannon, shooting those little sticky conidia spores in all directions. And check this out. If the spore lands on a part of a fly that it can't infect, like a wing, it can create its own spore cannon and fire off another spore. Sporeception. Pew. Now imagine you're an uninfected fly in the area. These deadly spores popping off in all directions? I mean, it's pretty grim, <laughs> but it actually gets worse. In the process of making these spores, compounds are secreted that are essentially sexual signals, causing other flies to come over and try to have sex with the corpse. I know what you're thinking, what's so bad about that? Well, remember the sticky stuff that glued the mouth parts to the surface? Well, it didn't just come out the mouth parts. So if you try to have sex with this corpse, you get stuck to it. 
And now, not only are you infected, but you've got some explaining to do when you go to work tomorrow. And you know Dave from accounting's gonna say something like, Ooh, looks like you had an interesting weekend. And you're like, yes, it was a nice weekend, Dave. Went antiquing, planted some herbs, f***ed a corpse, and did some light spring cleaning, thank you very much. Freaking Dave. Listen, when these zombie fungi come for us, we're going to need the skills to fight back. The kind of skills you can learn at Brilliant.org. I mean, if movies have taught me anything, we're going to have to build robot suits, and that's complicated. Luckily, Brilliant has thousands of lessons, from foundational and advanced math to AI, data science, neural networks, and more. And there's new lessons added every month. If learning something new sounds overwhelming, you haven't tried Brilliant. It's interactive and focused on everyday learning. Small bites that push you forward at your own pace. I mean, don't expect AI to save us. It'll be off playing chess by itself. Gonna make the flesh computers do all the work. This is the sort of learning that gives you a leg up, both in the workforce, but also in appreciating the world around you. To try everything Brilliant has to offer, free, for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash zayfrank or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Brilliant is a longtime sponsor of True Facts. Please check them out today. Where were we? Oh, right. Entomophthora is not the only genus of fungi that learned how to control the insects that they eat. Ophiocordyceps is perhaps one of the most well-known. It's a bit of a show-off, really. The genus eats all sorts of insects. But Ophiocordyceps unilateralis is particularly good at manipulating carpenter ants. The end of the infection is a lot like Entomophthora. The ant goes up, then its mouth parts are attached to a leaf or a twig, and then the fungus kills them and makes babies. The resulting ant looks a bit like Maleficent on a bad hair day. But how the fungus does it evolved independently and seems to be very different. For one, unlike Entomophthora, Ophiocordyceps cells don't enter the brain. They do, however, seem to secrete compounds that hijack the ant's central nervous system. Now, it can be hard to figure out what part the fungus is doing and what part is just the ant being really f***ing sick. But it's pretty clear as the infection spreads, the ant is a bit broken. It starts staggering around and convulses, which means that it falls. Would be very embarrassing for a healthy ant. But it's thought that this falling helps make sure that the ant doesn't get too far up in the trees and instead will stay closer to the forest floor for what happens next. Now, on its final day, this wobbly ant goes out and finds itself a leaf or a twig above the forest floor. The fungus needs the ant to attach itself very firmly, but it doesn't use glue. This fungus takes over control of the ant's mouth parts. Here, this is crazy. This is what a healthy muscle cell in an ant's mandible looks like. You can even see the motor neurons coming in and connecting to it. And here's what the muscle looks like when it's infected. Those are fungal cells that have surrounded the muscle. But they don't just surround the muscle, the fungal cells start connecting to each other. And then some of them connect into the muscle itself. It's like a poorly knit sweater of fungus. If you slice through a section of the ant's jaw, you can see that the fungus is friggin' everywhere. So when it's time to get the ant to bite down, the fungus seems to be very much in control of the machinery. On a leaf, the bite is almost always around that center vein. And it's deep. Those are the bite marks. As the ant bites, the fungus destroys the muscle tissue, which makes it impossible for the ant to ever let go. At this height off the forest floor, the conditions are just right for the fungus to take its time. Over the next week or so, the fungus consumes what's left to be eaten, and then sends up a stalk or fruiting body from just behind the head. And from here, the spores are released, ready to find an ant of their own to love and kill. Now here's the thing, <laughs> those two stories were kind of nice <laughs> compared to this one. Fungi in the genus Massospora, which is a dad joke time bomb, have a taste for cicadas. Now some cicadas are around every year, but some species only come up every 13 to 17 years, all at once. And for a fungus that likes to eat them, that's a buffet worth waiting for. For those 13 to 17 years, the cicada lives underground as a nymph. Spores of the fungus can also be found in that soil. And as these cicada nymphs begin to emerge, some of them are infected. Getting right to it, the fungus eats away the cicada's abdomen and sexual organs, which apparently they can live without. Then it creates a whole bunch of canidia spores, which form a sort of plug back there. You could say their back end is a mass of spora. <laughs> I told you. These little canidia are specially designed to quickly infect other cicadas. Now, you might think that having a half-body riddled with fungus would be a bit of a red flag in the dating world. But the fungus has some tricks. Some species of Massospora pump the cicada full of psilocybin, which is the hallucinogenic compound in magic mushrooms. 
And it also creates cathinone, which is a stimulant. So the infected cicadas are the life of the party. <laughs> Todd, what happened to your ass? Who cares? Woo! <laughs> the fungus also does something else that's quite sneaky. It somehow manipulates infected male cicadas into changing their mating call, which normally sounds like this, to sound like a female cicada, which sounds like this. I mean, the bottom line is that the fungus is able to trick a lot of cicadas into dry humping the conidia. And these little conidia start to infect their hosts, but, sorry, their hosts, but in a different way. The fungus of these conidia-infected cicadas will also devour the abdomen and genitals of their hosts. But instead of creating more conidia and trying to infect even more adults, they fill up what used to be the abdomen with these thick-shelled spores. These infected cicadas act basically normal. However, in going about their business, they rain these thick-shelled spores down onto the ground below, where they will wait for another 13 to 17 years to infect the next cycle. Yeah. So, that's how they do it. <laughs> it's so fucked up. I mean, it's hard to root for the fungus on this one. Really. Athlete's foot is a fungus, do you know that? Eats keratin, which is in our skin and nails. And that's the scouting party. It's just a matter of time. i tell you what, I'm gonna cinch my pants real tight. <laughs> Can't make my ass fall off. I mean, the movies get it all wrong. Zombies are just gonna be people all hopped up on mushrooms and cocaine trying to get you to hump a powder ball that ate their junk. No, it always looks like that. <laughs> they got little sprinkles falling out the gaps in the short pants. <laughs> and then one day you see them shimmy up a flagpole and attach by deep-throating that knob on top. Dave, what you doing up there? Oh. And then he just withers away. You know, make that into a movie. Call it The Last Ass of Us. <laughs>